Today, uh, we have with us uh, Catherine Hilgenkamp, who is going to be speaking on traditional Hawaiian healing and Western influence. Catherine has a private counseling practice called Life Solutions. She also teaches online classes for Capella University in their Masters and PhD Human Behavior programs, uh, and an academic advisor and associate professor at Webster University. Dr. Hogan Camp is also the author of Environmental Health, Ecological Perspectives. The subject of her talk today uh, was published in the California Journal of Health Promotion in 2003 by the same title, Traditional Hawaiian Healing and Western Influence. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Catherine Hogan Camp. Thank you. Can everyone hear me all right? Okay. Um, I'm, I guess you could say, a hybrid health educator, um, counselor, that's her thing. I've done a lot of things in my life, I guess, and I've traveled quite a bit. I also live in several different places. I actually did have the opportunity to live in Hawaii many years ago, and um, I picked up some of the information in that here. One of the things that's very interesting about the uh, literature in Hawaiian healing and Hawaiian medicine is that there's very little written about it. And uh, I don't exactly know what the uh, reason why is for that, uh, other than the Hawaiian culture is uh, pretty much a verbal type of culture, and they don't tend to write things down. So that might be one of the reasons for that. All right, so one of the things in the counseling field that I deal with a lot is working with cultural competence. In the Webster University program that we have, we have 120 campuses worldwide. They were initially started on military bases, and so that's one of my life dreams is to go and visit each one of the Webster University campuses. But you know, the term cultural competence for me is a very difficult one. I, I really am not sure that we can ever be quite culturally competent. Um, it's defined in many different ways, but unless you've actually lived there, have relatives there, perhaps married somebody in that culture, you really um, do seem to be at a disadvantage. And so um, I just wanted to take you on a little trip to Hawaii. If nothing else today, you can have a mental vacation, because I know you're probably exhausted. But uh, we have the Hawaiian Islands, and most of them are inhabited with the exception of one. It was used as a bombing range and has been used as a bombing range for about 20 um, and 40 years um, after the Pearl Harbor invasion, which doesn't necessarily make Americans um, popular with most Hawaiian people. Um, the, one of the reasons why that we don't find many statistics on Hawaiian uh, health is because they tend to put them all in a category called Pacific Islanders. If you, you know, have had any questionnaires filled out recently or you had to check what your ethnic background is. It just seems to be a, um, a guess kind of thing. And there's generally for federal standards nothing where you can mark mixed or biracial, things like that. Um, but most of the people from the Pacific Islands uh, are from several different places. Samoa, Guam, um, the, Polynesia, Micronesia, and in fact, um, before I came here too, I was reading about discrimination on the Hawaiian Islands for health care for Micronesians. Um, it was only recently that they were accepted as for Medicaid, which I thought was pretty interesting. But it just goes to show you that you know, there still is some um, difficulty with health care among certain populations on the islands. The islanders typically were descended from early Polynesians, although we don't really know exactly where they came from. But in uh, the definition for Native Hawaiian is anyone who is a descendant of the Aboriginal people prior to 1778 occupied and exercised uh, with the sovereignty in the area now considered the state of Hawaii. And once again, a lot of the people don't really know where their ancestors came from, so it's uh, difficult to get an exact number on the number of Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian people. In fact, um, we find that they're um, often overlooked. Um, so a 
about 1980, I guess it was, one of the congressmen from Hawaii was trying to establish um, a tribe for Native Hawaiians, and it's still in the works. A lot of it, the Hawaiians are not sure that that's the status that they really want to take. A lot of Hawaiians, Native Hawaiians, live in California and different areas of the United States, and so you know, they don't necessarily congregate in one particular place, so it's been very difficult for them to uh, get that status. But they'd like to. They'd like to get the rights back to their land, and they'd like to have some government assistance, things like that, that they haven't been able to achieve. Mm -hmm. The name for a Native Hawaiian is considered a Kanakimoi, and um, you're going to have to bear with me on my pronunciation from um, Hawaiian language. I'm not good at any kind of language that I've ever tried to study, and that's partially because of my Midwestern accent and having lived in the South for a good long time. So uh, you know, I apologize for that in advance. And if, has anyone in here ever visited Hawaii? Okay, so you know if you try to say something in their language that you know that just doesn't go over well. Yeah, yeah, and, and so um, you know, immediately you recognize the Howley, and uh, so there's a lot of mistrust that goes along with that. Currently, I live in the Myrtle Beach area, and we have a, a tourist population that comes to visit us as well. And even though it's good for our economy and creates jobs and that sort of thing, there are some nuisances and irritations that go along with that. And you tend to try to avoid times when tourists are in the area. But if anybody wants to throw in any comments or experiences that they've had in Hawaii, I'd be um, glad to entertain those. The essence in uh, the Hawaiian culture is that you live in harmony with nature, just like most Native Americans do, and that you tend to be self-sufficient and live off the land. And that creates some of the problems uh, with the health care that we have been seeing in Hawaii. But the essence of the wellness is the oneness, lokahi, the harmony, pono. And the harmony is very, very important to Native Hawaiians. They um, just really want to be able to get along with people. They don't like conflict. Although sometimes conflict is engaged, they have a, a certain way that they tend to um, rectify that. <laughs> I was just going to play this little video for you too. I thought my give me a chance to take that medical break. I hope it works. Um, I'm going to give you an essence of some of the porn culture there. <laughs> Thank you. 
generation with modern data point. Diagnose, thank you. 
the plants that we <coughs> often learn how to use the sacred prayers. Um, they can perform simple surgery, set bones, do autopsies, and they use a variety of different techniques. The version of the Hawaiian body mind spirit connection is that there are really three different body points that need to be, you know, in harmony and sync. One being the top of the head. And they believe that's really important because when a child is born, the font nails and the uh, skull are open, and so they feel that that's a very important developmental place where things can still pass through and come in and, and go out. Also, to be attached to one's family and their foreign or origin, their ancestors, that sort of thing, the navel is very important. And of course, in order to propagate the population, genitalia is very, also very important. Um, the mana is very important when it comes to looking at sickness, so they diagnose that. They use magic and other different types of chants and prayers to kind of try and heal that spirit and that energy. Um, and we were talking about that last night, I believe, that they tend to really not like weakness in people, and so um, you know they really do all they can to try and bring that back up to uh, where they think it should be. And the ritual of making things right, it can involve an apology or forgiving somebody who has wronged them, but it's very important that, um, that they are healed in that way. And they do believe in the power of God and prayer. Um, the Big Kahuna, there was a book actually written in there as a movie, I believe. Um, I can't recall the, the actor's name now, but uh, it, it's really kind of a farce, and so you probably won't want to run it necessarily, but there was a book written in the 20s called The Big Kahuna. The man actually was not able to find a Kahuna because, you know, at that time they were all underground, so if they came out, they might be arrested because, well, you'll find out later. But he wrote this book, and, and of course there were falsehoods involved in that, and we, for whatever reason, <coughs> Perhaps you um, felt bad about it, I'm not sure. But there are also different types of kahunas. There are those who set bones, those who diagnose with fingers, those who deliver babies, those who help when you get pregnant, just a general herbalist, somebody who is skilled in loamy loamy massage, um, the pediatrician, the love doctor, and then of course the witch doctors. Um, the sanctuaries or the temples have healing powers themselves, so they're set up in certain areas according to that. Um, one being the home of the ruling chief, and there's a caste system that was in, um, in place early on, so they still honor those different places. It may have been a, the birthing place of a ruler or a healer, or where the ruler actually lived themselves. They have um, lots of medicinal gardens herbs that they use, and um, so a, spe a very special place that you may want to visit is um, <coughs> called Coconut Island on Tuzo. Um, I don't know if you visited that place or not, but if you did go, oh, that would be great if you share that with us. But they have um, healing waters there. The Hawaiian history is very important for us to honor and respect that, too. It explains a lot why the Hawaiians feel about us the way that they do. The Hawaiians uh, believed that they were around a thousand years before the American colonies, and there was a caste system. Each person in that caste system had a special responsibility that went along to um, the tribe and preserving their heritage. There was also a moniker, monarchy, I'm sorry, I can't say that correctly, but um, you know, there were the kings and the queens and they also had chiefs and under that there were more chiefs and everybody was held accountable for whether or not they did what they were supposed to do or not. There were also slaves who were considered outcasts. We don't have a whole lot of information about that, but they did the worst of the worst work. But there was a working class and they did also some hard labor as well. King Kamehameha is uh, one of the greatest kings considered who was there at the same time that Captain James Cook came in. Um, his successor then was King David. Um, king David and his sister, um, Queen Philippa 
were actually raised by other people. I'm not exactly sure how that works, um, but the nobles were raised by certain people who could prepare them for the royalty and the positions that they were to have. And um, but they had a lot of trouble once uh, after Cook came in and, and you know started taking over the culture. I guess you could say. Um, they didn't want conflict, and so they tended to just kind of go along and agree with things the way they were. Um, the last queen uh, also had to sign a paper, just like her brother did for her, that limited the powers of the monarchy successively after that. And she was actually, I can't say really jailed, they put her in a hotel for about a year and wouldn't let her leave because they were afraid that she might create an uprising and she had several followers who were willing to support her in that. Um, so here we have Captain James Cook and he came to the islands of Kauai and Morocco and um, at that time there were up to 800,000 Hawaiians, Hawaiians at the time. Uh, the missionaries came in and decided that they needed to come in and, and bring Christianity to the islands and um, with them and with the sailors that came, there were a lot of diseases that came along that they didn't have a resistance to. Um, also, at, at about the year of 1820, they decided that the Hawaiian language was to be banned and they were to stop doing those heathen acts that were considered you know, medicine. And so a lot of the healing practices that they had went underground. When the, the government came in and started doing certain things, they decided that the Lomi was something that they really didn't want to, anyone to do because of the diseases and all. Um, the population for Native Hawaiians went down to 40,000, which was really amazing. Um, they brought all kinds of you know, fatal diseases with them, and also, of course, uh, we have Father Damien and his work with the lepers. And, and most of that has been eradicated now with sulfur drugs. <laughs> Lomi Lomi is, even if you were to ask for that today, like the last time I went in and I had a one year and I asked for Lomi Lomi, you didn't you have to be considered acceptable to, to do that. Uh, get that procedure, it's really considered for Hawaiians only, and um, they don't think, want to talk about it very much. Uh, some of the some of the most beautiful Lomi Lomi, but there are also other Lomi Lomi practitioners. <clears throat> and the whole idea is before a person receives the treatment, they need to go out to the herb gardens and pluck the herbs that they would like to have used during the procedure. And nobody is allowed to distract them so they can take all the time that they want to to pick out the herbs that they would like. <clears throat> and uh, eventually Lomi Lomi was out, um, outlawed so that no one could practice that. So once again, it was only for the people in white. You can see they use sticks, they use their feet, they use their elbows, and it's a lot like switch massage that incorporates other different procedures. Um, in 1893, there was an illegal U.S. armed invasion that pretty much just came over and decided that they were going to take over the uh, islands of Hawaii and incorporate that into the uh, states. And they didn't take that very well. Um, there were Howley board members that were uh, on the Hawaiian Medicine Board. Now we do have more Native Americans on some of the health boards, particularly in some of the clinics that are on the islands. And uh, but notice that once the um, English came in, they decided that they wanted to use the Western scientific names for the plants. So there's so many plants that haven't been identified in that respect. The Board of Massage was established in 1947 prior to um, Hawaii becoming a statehood and uh, they decided that they wanted to regulate the practitioners so that they were um, official, I guess you could say. And so they required a written test for those who wanted to practice on the army. And uh, of course a lot of Hawaiians didn't write and they didn't read and so they wanted to they pass the test. And so once again, they continued to practice on the army, but they just didn't tell anybody that they were doing that, and everybody kept it pretty much hush hush. Um, they considered uh, treatment by the herbalist to be obsolete in 1965, which is not that you know, far away from where we are now. Um, and then they also built the first medical school in 1967, 
so you can see kind of how far behind they are in health care and really still are today. Um, the Native Hawaiians do feel persecuted because of the tourists and everybody coming in and pretty much telling them what to do in their own islands. Um, they resent the dominant white male paradigm uh, <coughs> and um, especially you know, the bottom of the islands. And so they feel that, you know, they're, I guess, it's treated like minorities, which they don't like very much. It's their island after all. And so they tend to mistrust people who come in and want to uh, offer health care and other services to them. There is a lot of violence on the island. Um, about 50% of the Native Americans actually graduate from high school. Many of them don't go to school regularly. There are schools now that teach Native foreign language, which has only been becoming acceptable in the last few years. And um, so, um, so people tend to want to, to attend those schools, but again, you know, it's going to be a bilingual program. So if you're a Hawaii and you want to go to that school, you would be discriminated against. Um, I hate to say it that way, but it's kind of how it feels. Uh, the Kanaka Maoli have the worst statistics. Less of them own their own homes. A lot of them just feel like they should be able to live off the land. And, um, so they're not worried about making lots of money. There is a high amount of juvenile crime there. And 40% um, of prison inmates are Native Hawaiians, which is really um, kind of incredible. Just under kind of resistance to the islands. It is the fourth largest ethnic group on the islands. Um, you can see that the whites tend to outnumber them and then have the Japanese populations as well. One of the things that is remarkable about the Native Hawaiians is that they have the shortest life expectancy of any of the populations in the United States. And that's still true today. It's, um, it's gone up since uh, the 1990s and this year, I think it's up to about 73.4 now. Um, and a lot of that has been because of the improvements in health care. They have high infant mortality rates. Um, they have a lot of pregnant mothers and unmarried mothers which contribute to that. They tend to not want to seek health care voluntarily necessarily <coughs> until all things have been tried. They also have um, the highest incidence of age when we need the wine. Um, they have high rates of obesity, they tend to like to drink alcohol and smoke cigarettes and take their chances. Um, in 1994, they did a cardiovascular <coughs> risk survey and found that there were a number of people who had uh, hypertension and uh, high cholesterol, diabetes. In fact, diabetes is probably the number one health problem down here today. Um, they brought in some people to try and work with them change their health habits, but um, they haven't been really successful because they like to eat the diet. But Lapa'au is uh, the name for Hawaiian medicine, and they brought it back, actually, in 1985, which is also quite recent. And um, the Native Hawaiian health care centers have been established with some federal monies that have been provided. Most of the islands have a health clinic for Native Americans there. They also have uh, people on their board who are Native Hawaiians so that they can um, have some say in how things are to be done. And again, they bring in the kahunas from the temples and they still um, continue with the training. Um, one of the things I mentioned before that is very difficult to get some exact statistics on the Native Hawaiian health problems because they are lumped in to different categories and many of them are multi or biracial and so that complicates getting the statistics that you need for uh, brands and that sort of thing. Also, there are other literature that is written, um, like there as a person by the name of Gus Salas who has done a lot of work with physical activity and health promotion. Most of his work is with Native Hawaiians who live in California. Um, that's quite interesting. You can see too that uh, when it comes to health insurance and re getting reimbursement for services from Native Hawaiians, that quite a number of them don't have health insurance, and that's also a huge 
barrier and it creates some of the health disparities that we're seeing. This is a, a chart that shows you uh, there was a program that was started back in about uh, 2006, I believe, for the homeless. And they looked at the homeless populations to see that primarily the biggest group were Native Hawaiians. So, um, they uh, created a Native Hawaiian Health Care Act and uh, helped create some of the clinics that they have there. They uh, <coughs> amended the laws to provide more money, but you can see some of the clinics aren't real pretty and they aren't necessarily really new, um, and that just helps with some of the distrust to be um, compensated for, I guess you could say. Um, they believe that, yes sir? Can I have a question or should we wait? But it's kind of topical with this. I know, you know, the Native Americans have their own health care system financed by the U.S. government. Hawaiians don't have any such thing. Mm -hmm. it seems to be a mm -hmm. um, I suppose they don't do it enough, perhaps, to promote the needs of people. Again, when you're looking at just trying to get along with people, they don't really want to create a lot of um, hostility or um, anything like that. A lot of the practitioners, especially the communities, do not accept money for their services. They'll take whatever that person is able to give. The communities uh, don't see any reason why they need to be certified or regulated or licensed or anything like that. They don't worry about liability insurance or anything like that because most of their procedures are really not that invasive anyway. Um, they don't want to really submit to the dominant Western culture, although, like I said, if they have a good working relationship with the clinics and with the hospitals, they are allowed to come in, especially if the family really pushes it because of um, really believe in the spiritual aspects of the care that they're able to provide. Um, there, there's still some, you know, controversy about Lomi Lomi, like I mentioned before, and um, so if you're lucky, might be able to find a practitioner who's willing to assist you with that. Um, in the future, they <coughs> believe that the Hawaiian population, the native Hawaiian population, is actually going to increase now. I'm not exactly sure what accounts for that, but um, if you were to look at the American statistics, I think it's about 0.1% uh, of our population is what we consider to be Pacific Islanders. Um, and so um, it's significant in the Hawaiian Islands, about 10% of their population is expected to be um, Pacific Islanders, and of those, 50% would be Native Hawaiians. They are overrepresented for, um, I mean, you saw the picture of the morbidly obese singer that um, died uh, not that long ago, I guess you could say. Um, they do have a significant number of mental illnesses, although you know there's a stigma attached to mental illnesses as to what is actually defined as mental illness and what is it. And they have a lot of diabetic and respiratory disorders. It's very interesting that when I, you go online and you try to pull, on, pull up some statistics about the health problems of um, the Native Hawaiians, you don't see a whole lot of information and they just tend to not want to update it. I don't know the reason for that. Um, perhaps they just don't feel important and um, they're resistant to federal funding um, because of the rules and the regulations that go along with that. But they do have um, behavioral health clinics in different places and um, again sometimes the elders are called in, the families are called in, it's a family ordeal. There is some literature with the social workers too that show that um, they have a relatively limited in what they could do to help um, the Native Hawaiians because they just really aren't um, you know, considered as good as what they've already had with the new stuff.